Um, welcome to this week's Future Trends Forum. I'm Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, chief cat herder, and I'm welcoming you to today's session, which is a community exploration of the rest of 2023, what we're thinking about, what we're concerned about, what we're hoping for, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Now, today's topic is all of us and all of us together looking at what comes next. So the usual forum format is to have one or several guests who are expert in one particular piece of the puzzle of higher education's future. But every so often we break out to have a melting of the minds where we put our minds together and think about where we are headed. And that means both the collective we, where academia as a whole, all of our colleges and universities, all of our scholarly publishers and all of our libraries, where we're all headed for the rest of the year, but also for us individually, where you see your program, your department, your work headed. Uh, this is not a programmatic event, so we don't have a specific agenda with items to tick down. Instead, I have a few ideas I'm gonna hurl at you, but then I wanna open the floor so that all of you can share your thoughts and your ideas. So let me get rid of that slide, and let me just welcome all of you. Um, let's see, uh, Tom, if you're, uh, if Shindig doesn't want you to let you use the camera, try refreshing the page for a start. That often takes care of that problem. And Doyle, I hope uh, Kentucky is nice and bright and shiny. And John, 80 degrees, 80 degrees in Madison? Bask in that, bask in that. Giselle, I'm guessing it's more than 80 degrees there. And Melanie? Hello, hello, and hello, Ellen. You two aren't too far away from each other. And Sarah, hi. Yeah, not too far from you. I'm just, I'm just in town for literally a few hours uh, for a couple of meetings um, here and back. Uh, not enough time to visit, I'm afraid, but I'm really glad to see you. Uh, Tom, check with Wesson. Um, there's usually a couple of quick fixes we can do for cameras. So just to, just to begin with, uh, uh, a few things that uh, I'm looking forward to uh, or anticipating, because I don't necessarily mean I'm excited about uh, or happy about, but uh, these are things that I'm uh, thinking about. Uh, one of them is uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has a few major cases on its docket, and they may rule in ways that have uh, a lot of importance. Uh, one has to do with the Biden administration's student loan forgiveness, and I'm really curious to see which way they go. My, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but my, from everything I've read, my instinct is that uh, they will shut it down uh, or, or stop it or, or weaken it in some way. Um, I think uh, either way, uh, our good friend Don Charles says that he thinks that uh, ruling either way will increase public skepticism about higher ed. So if we have the loan forgiveness shut down, then that means that uh, people will be more afraid of student loans. And if it's actually accepted, the skepticism about the plan will, will increase. Uh, a second ruling has to do, uh, I just forgot the name of the case, um, has to do with uh, affirmative action in uh, college admissions. Uh, and again, a lot of legal press that I've been reading suggests that the Supreme Court will rule to end uh, preferential admissions in uh, in uh, higher education. Uh, we know from history that recent history that uh, ending such programs tends to immediately depress uh, Black and Latino enrollment. Uh, so that is definitely a major risk uh, for this moving forward. So those are two uh, two of the Supreme Courts that I'm looking at right now. Uh, so two of the Supreme Court decisions that may come up. Um, uh, Don uh, Charles also reminds us um, that we should be paying attention to the enrollment cliff. Uh, so uh, some of you know that I've been tracking the decline in American higher education enrollment, uh, which started in 2012 uh, and has trickled down, poured down in uh, COVID and continues to trickle down now, supposedly after COVID. So I'm very concerned about high school graduation rates, how many people come out of this, how many apply, and to what extent adult learners uh, enroll in higher education. So I'm very, very interested to see what data we get about fall enrollment numbers. Uh, now, Kiel uh, Dunsch, our good friend, uh, pointed this out to a Chronicle of Higher Education article. And I'm just going to share this here um, in the chat. Um, now, it's behind a paywall. Um, so I'm not going to have a, uh, uh, I'm, if you don't have access to it, uh, you might not be able to uh, read it right now. Uh, but I just want to hit a couple of the major highlights of it uh, just to uh, share, because I think it's, it's, it's pretty powerful. Um, 
the the piece here is uh, concerning. Uh, it's a criticism of of where higher education is right now, um, based on a few different uh, angles and a few different issues. Um, and here, let me just bring this up so everyone can see it. Um, The title is Higher Education's Grim and a Soulless Future, which is a, a great title, a kind of death metal title. Um, so you can imagine you know, someone saying that higher ed's grim, soulless, and techified future. Um, but Francois Furstenberg, uh, who's a historian, uh, starts off by taking a look at Temple University uh, and finding that uh, the crisis there, if you, if you didn't follow it, this was uh, a new president who published a book on his vision for higher education, which is a very professional vision. Uh, and he tried to break a grad student uh, union strike, uh, including doing the unusual method of removing uh, strikers' uh, tuition and medical um, support during the strike. Uh, this backfired, the university settled and the president resigned, um, which is uh, pretty drastic and unusual. Uh, and uh, Professor Furstenberg argues that what we're seeing is uh, uh, a whole kind of neo-corporate, neoliberal plan uh, for higher education, uh, which emphasizes uh, reducing human capital, uh, reducing compensation, squeezing the number of people who actually work there. Technology plays a role in uh, reducing costs and uh, first of our charges with replacing uh, human interaction and degrading the overall experience. So uh, I'd be happy to say more about that uh, if we get a chance, but I want to make sure that uh, uh, everyone gets to see that. Um, uh, Kiel says it's a free subscription. Um, Kiel, is that right? Um, I thought Inside Higher Ed had the free uh, subscription law uh, and that Chronicle charged you. Um, but if not, well, that's good news. And then in the chat, um, uh, Elena, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read your name, Elena. Uh, I believe it's Old Mally. Um, uh, Elena O'Malley mentions uh, ChatGPT. So this is in many ways, one of the uh, great, great challenges. In fact, this just came up in a meeting I had this morning. Um, people are doing, uh, are very concerned about large language models, both for chat, gener text generation and for image generation. They're very concerned about what they might mean in numerous directions. We've had a series of uh, forum sessions on this, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, say more about that, but I'm also happier to hear uh, more from you. Um, so let's see. Um, those are a few things that I'm thinking about. Um, and these are a few things that are uppermost in my mind right now. Which of these would you like to discuss? Or are there other topics that you'd like to bring up? Uh, so please just fling us a note in the chat box uh, or click the Q&A box uh, if you'd like, or raise your, click your hand raise so that you can join me on stage. I'd be glad to host you. I'm going to try and bring up Tom. Uh, we might be having a camera issue, so let me see if I can get him. Hey, there's the blue room. There's yep, the did blue a re room. Did a complete restart. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfectly. Like everything's fine. All right. And you're talking through your pop card, so it looks good. So the, the last, the last thing I heard before I restarted my computer was, "Technology degrades the human experience." Is yeah. Have you Have you read this piece? No, I have not. I, and I'll, I'll have to take a look at it, but. I'm sorry that that's um, alarmist uh, techno panic talking there. I mean, look, we we have a human experience right now through the mediation of technology that is enriching because I'm talking to people across the country or the world. I don't know who's here from outside the U.S. at this point, but it's happened. <laughs> um, and talking to you and and and, and seeing your lovely beard, uh, and uh, so. I think the the problem with a lot of the way we think about these things is, is it's not technology; it's badly designed and badly implemented technology that degrades the experience. I mean, I think we can create uh, technology experiences that augment what we're doing in the in-person environments that uh, completely changes what we can do. You know this, and and 
and the idea that suddenly everything is closing down. Well, in certain aspects, yeah, education's absolutely going to have to adapt. And there was a question that I threw out to you earlier today in a, in a different yeah. format, which is, you know, what what is really being threatened by AI here and, and all of these changes? Is it is it learning and teaching or is it administration? Is it the logistics yeah. Yeah. of yeah. mass education that we have put into place since the 1940s? 50s uh gi bill whatever uh those things i mean we have to you know all of us grew up in that system uh and so that's the that's the environment the world that we know of grades transcripts all the other semester credit hours and so on and so forth if you go back further than that though you will see that's not the world of education that existed by and large before world war ii uh -huh. so you know, it's a matter of perspective. It's a blip. You know, the blip may have been the world we grew up in on a lot of different levels, including climate change and consumerism and all the other things that went with that. And I think, yes, we're on we're on the we're on the cusp of a change. The smoke from which we've seen for 20 years now and generally refuse to acknowledge uh, AI is just the latest uh, nail in that coffin, so to speak. Um, but who are we burying here? Are we burying learning and, and knowledge? I mean, this is a human thing that goes back since we came down from the trees. We've lost the ability to tap into that, into that uh, desire, that knowledge. And that's what's in, under threat. You know, if we're talking about an industrial model that basically spews out students like widgets and makes them pay for the experience, as, as Kyle will gladly, I'm sure... <laughs> <laughs> uh, second that. Um, yeah, okay, we're cruising for a bruising. Um, and uh, we also miss, I mean, the demographic shift, I've been saying this for over a decade now. That means we need to attract different customers. Yeah, there are less 18 to 24 year olds. That's That should not be our only market. Uh, and uh, no matter where the institution is, I mean, we don't want to stop. The idea that we stop learning after we get out of college is ludicrous. Uh, we learn a lot more after we get out of college and for the rest of our lives. And when you stop it. learning, then you're in real trouble. Let me pause you there just for a second, because this is great. And this is me nodding uh, along with you. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And, uh, and, and you've got a, a lot of support here in the chat. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, so uh, kill uh, seconds here. Um, <laughs> just, just really quickly, um, just to just to summarize this, and I can give you a couple of good quotes if if, if you would like. Uh, the main charge here, I think, is first uh, saying that uh, universities think university administrations thinking in very market corporate terms are turning to educational technology in order to save money and also to measure things which are difficult to measure, uh, namely certain skills. Um, take a take a look at the whole piece. I, I can't. Yeah. I, I don't want to read the whole thing, but but the but the saving money part. That's part where the I think the degree of experience is basically swapping out technology for people. Uh, and I agree completely um, what you say. I mean, first of all, we're connecting through technology, and also humans do connect through technology. But um, the uh, uh, another part is that. Uh, the author sees this as allied to uh, for-profit uh, entities. Um, mm -hmm. I just quoted him. Sorry. Um, the uh, uh, so that's that's the profit motive is there. I mean, this is overall a, a, an attack on, or sorry, a critique of higher education as being too neoliberal. The the point about skills is interesting. Uh, Francois argues that uh, that the uh, that it's actually hard to measure skills and the skills that employers are looking for are often the soft skills, which are harder to measure. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what employers are really looking for is the liberal arts uh, graduate, um, mm -hmm. which schools like Temple were apparently turning against. Um, and there, there's there's more to it, but I, I, I definitely yeah. a, a, agree agree with you, Rhett. Um, so, uh, yeah, real quick on the, on the uh, measurement thing, you know, over a decade ago, I was on a task force with the uh, with our good friend Ruben and others uh, at the New Media Consortium to figure out learning analytics. And after about a year's worth of work, we basically came to the conclusion that the technology was not the issue. We could build the technology. It's the fact that we don't know the right questions to ask. We don't understand what learning is. So what are we measuring? I mean, how are you going to measure something you can't under you don't really understand? And I would say that that's that's a big problem with traditional learning analytics, which measure may, may, may be more adept at measuring 
um, content skills, uh, but it's an even bigger problem when it comes to soft skills because you you mm -hmm. nurture those, mm -hmm. you don't learn them. You, you provide avenues for people to maximize their soft skills. And that's a conversation. That's not something you can necessarily, I mean, you can test for it and see where they are at the other end, but can you come up with a test that gets you there? I don't think so. I think that really is a conversation. Interesting. Interesting. I think so. I, I think, I think this is right. Um, uh, let me, Tom, if you can, if you can stick around there just, just for sure. a minute, um, I'd like to bring up, um, on the point of skills, uh, our friend Giselle LaRose, who uh, should be in the wonderful city of New Orleans today. Uh, and Giselle in, in the chat shared a link to a burning glass study uh, about skills measurement. And Giselle is, of course, also a big fan of uh, online conversations like this one. Uh, welcome, Giselle. Hi, how, how are you? Good, it's really good to see you again. How's everything down there in the Big Easy? Good, good. I'm glad Tom stayed in the uh, in the mix because I'd like to see my purpose in being here was to listen to the audience, but I'll be glad to add to what Tom said already to, to stimulate the conversation. Very good. Uh, well, well tell, tell us a bit more about this skills measurement that you're, that you're this is about. This is an article that I think uh, needs to go far and wide. Uh, primarily, uh, the they looked at... I think I'm going to cite the number right, 224 million job postings and uh, really dove into the magnitude of change that needs to occur from educational providers and businesses. But predominantly, educational providers need to rethink, you know, are they offering the curriculums that the future job market is demanding? And um, I, I think their findings are pretty impressive. So I'd love to hear, you know, to, to, to pony piggyback on your original question, Brian, like what are we doing to get ready for spring and fall? Mm -hmm how many institutions are making a strategic move to expand their continuing education departments? Hmm. Why continuing education though? Why is that in particular? Because to build on what, what Mark just said is that we need to reach the adult learner. And those adult learners aren't going to go back for a degree program. They're not going to make the $60,000 commitment yeah. for a second degree, but they are going to look to upskill and reskill. So how widespread, you know, we can talk about it, but I want to know, is there action? Are, are you uh -huh. seeing action on your campus for curriculum mapping, cur with business needs, first and foremost, and then are you seeing, you know, curriculum restructuring to meet the needs of things like computer coding, uh, UX designer, cybersecurity yeah. specialist. Yeah. Um, the one that I like to repeat that really, really engages as an audience is having a job as a nurtured meat farmer <laughs> whatever that is a meat farmer wow <laughs> who knows but let me let me uh turn it over to the audience to, to first say yes. are you seeing this trend on your campus That's is it just talk is it, it it's not her hyperbole it's definitely not hyperbole right and we in higher education can talk about a lot of things but is there action to match the talk? That's a great question, a great point. Uh, Chazelle, thank you. In, in the chat, Rox, Roxanne gives a counter uh, evidence, I'm afraid. She says, uh, private university in Connecticut has eliminated its lifelong learning program. Um, no reason wow. to. Wow. Uh, wow. That's really sad. Roxanne, which, which school is that? Um, if you could tell us. There's yeah. only one private university in Connecticut. I'm no, just kidding. <laughs> um, I, I want to, want to clarify uh, a, a real quick the point that Giselle made, though. Um, one of the other problems in this conversation is that employers don't necessarily know what skills they need. Uh, 
They don't. And I mean, what's the, you know, they may say, okay, I need a programmer, but what's the difference between a good programmer and a great programmer? You know, a good programmer is someone who has mastered. I, I like one. Of, let's just say, l- let me stick with programming here for a moment, because I think one of our biggest mistakes when it comes to coding is that we treat it like it's a technical skill when it's actually a foreign language skill. And so well a said. great, a good programmer is someone who understands the dictionary. A great programmer is someone who can sing the language. And, and that a lot of times gets missed in this conversation because it's like these two blind people reaching out to each other, higher education on one side and employers on the other going, well, we're not getting what we want and we don't know what to give you. Tell us. And we don't know, you know, and this, this goes on and on. And that's, and that's a challenge. I mean, I think the only real solution to that is to bring the employers. And I know some institutions have actually done this, uh, that, um, uh, which you bring the workplace into the envi- into the teaching environment in a very direct way, and then you 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 see who sinks and swims, and you try to figure that out. Now you can do that also as a, a research study as well. And again, I know that's been done, but um, the thing is, a lot of times this stuff is squishy, and yeah. and yeah. there's no no one size fits all, and that's a real problem. And that's where that this is why I teach adaptability and flexibility first and foremost in my classes. I like, you, you don't know what's coming at you. You know, you don't know what AR is, AI is going to do to your job in 10 years, but you need to be the one who's running the AI rather than the one who gets fired by the AI. And um, that's the theme in my book as well. I mean, that's, you know, you cannot, if you're, if you're going to be the slave to the technology, you're, you're fighting a losing battle. Yeah. If you're the master of the technology, when I say master, that doesn't mean you have to be a superstar programmer. You have to understand what's going on and how to use the technology. There's different pieces to that. You can be a superstar programmer, but that's not required. Uh, but the idea that you are a master of, of putting together your, your work environment or your personal environment when it comes to technology and, and finding the best pieces and constantly and knowing when to walk away from stuff because it's wrong. It's badly hmm. done. Hmm. That's hard. So, um, mm-hmm. and so that's, and that's what makes a good employee too, because they also can look at systems just like they look at technology and say, okay, this system makes a lot of sense. We'll use it. Or this system doesn't work so well. We need to make some changes to it and then, and then develop a new way of solving the problem and being adaptable. Uh, I don't, I don't see in the chat any other uh, volunteers of uh, answers to your question, Giselle, which, uh, which may just be evidence. Uh, however, uh, Elena O'Malley did want to join us from uh, Emerson. So let me just bring her up on stage so she can join us. Hello, Elena. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Oh, great. Now that you're here. Welcome aboard. <laughs> hey, welcome, everybody. I just wanted to ask, have you already, have you all already talked about Robot Proof? I'm reading not, it now. Oh, wow. Years not back. today. And uh, the author is just down the street from you, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, and I've only gotten a little bit. A little way into it, so I was, I was wondering if anyone else had it, uh, had gotten all the way through it. And, I have, and, I have. I, I think yeah. it's a very interesting book, uh, and and without doing violence to its uh, erudition, I'd say the idea, you know, of, of trying to have colleges and universities focus on what robots can't do well, um, I think is a very powerful prompt. Uh, yeah. You know, and so you know, uh, creativity, empathy, emotional, emotional intelligence. Um, it's, uh, it's very good stuff. Yeah. Well, and, and also a little bit to that point is, um, you know, what's, what's going on with the future of community colleges? Yeah. Because we, a, a lot of times when we talk about higher ed, we're, we're just not talking about community colleges. I know. And I, I am because I teach at one. I know. I know you are. <laughs> you are. Um, but I, I, I think a lot of times, uh, you know, because, you know, community colleges, you know, I hear a lot about the struggles that they're having. Um, you know, I, I, I hear about enrollment problems. And yet at the same time, I also hear this great, like, community colleges will solve all of our problems. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So. Well, we know enrollment has been dropping um, and, and it would be even lower still if it weren't for the huge expansion of dual enrollment uh, between community colleges and high schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's that's very widespread. 
Um, and we know that, uh, I mean, it varies depending on region, depending on college, but the community college enrollment is, is much lower. That's one detail. Um, the other thing is the uh, Biden administration pushed for a free uh, tuition for community colleges uh, plan, and that didn't go through. Uh, he said recently he wanted to try it again, but that doesn't seem to have uh, any traction right now. Um, Tom and Giselle, what are you hearing from the community college world? What would you like to add? I think it's really interesting that uh, the dual dual credit uh, enrollment is is what what's driving it. I mean, as I've said I said a few minutes ago, it's the eighteen to twenty four year olds. Everybody's got a problem with that, and community colleges appeal to the people who are least or most likely to make a choice about college. I.e., I. I'm going to college. I'm not going to college, um, and because the difference between the income that they have now versus the income that they potentially have by getting a college degree to them at least does not seem to be that huge. And so um, if they see a pathway forward without college, then they're more likely to say, I, I, I'm not doing this uh, or because of financial and all sorts of other factors. So that's why we saw the huge drops during the disproportionate drops during the pandemic, because those students were much more likely to be impacted by that and likely to say, eh, I don't see the worth to it. Um, the interesting thing I'm seeing, I think one way to interpret the dual credit surge is that instead of instead of expanding upward into the broader community, the post-college community, community colleges have discovered that the market, the easier market to exploit is the pre-college community. Uh -huh. And there are an awful lot of um, school districts who are scrambling to have enough teachers in the K-12 world to just cover the regular curriculum. And now you can get community colleges to come in and teach the half of the regular curriculum. That makes a lot of economic mm -hmm. sense on both sides. It does. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I'm speculating here. I will say that I'm not sure that's what, you know, and we may not know the answer to that yet, but that just seems like a logical, uh, it's, it's a lot harder. I, I had a vice chancellor tell me years ago, he says, it's, and, and, and he's right. You know, the the it's a lot cheaper to retain existing students than to try to recruit new ones. And I think Absolutely. you could extend Ooh. that into it's a yeah. lot cheaper to uh, mine an existing uh, well of students because we've already ha always had we've had dual credit for decades now. It's just really exploded. Um, it's a lot easier to mine that source than to try to uh, prospect whole new territories of forty year olds. Uh, who are, uh, you know, who, who need different types of services that you're not really sure of offering. Dual credit, you're teaching the same course that you would normally teach with some That's fiddling because right. there's some realistic logistical issues. But by, by and large, you're teaching the same course you've always taught. So it's, it's, it's not that big a shift. But trying to come up with a curriculum that appeals to the 45-year-old or the 50-year-old or the 60-year-old yeah. yeah. is a whole different ball game, and, and it's harder. And those people don't necessarily gravitate toward college when they need to learn something. Yeah. No, true. Sure. There's so many other, other locations. Uh, Giselle, so that's, were you going to add to that? Yeah. Oh, there's so much that could be said here. I mean, it's, it's, so, it's a growing opportunity. Um, the lines between the silos are blurring and anyone on this call, if, if you've been living your life, entire professional life inside of a four year institution, I strongly encourage you to go to your local community college and just hang out. Um, it's where the biggest opportunities are going to emerge. And if we could only see, you know, four year leaders look at what is happening in the high school dual enrollment to community college and build similar bridges between community college and four year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe mm -hmm. it's not to a four year degree program, but maybe it's to a four year quality micro credential that, that, that makes that, that continuum a, the pathway, the career pathway, a little bit clearer for an individual, someone who may have accounting background, but not a CPA, you know, where, where mm -hmm. are they going to mm -hmm. make that bridge? Um, I saw in the chat a little earlier, someone mentioned uh, Christidi's book on uh, the 60 year curriculum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
please don't take that out of context. It's not that any one university is going to manage everything that adults need <laughs> from 18 to 60, right? What he's saying is that we're living longer and we're working six decades of our lives and that both community high schools, community colleges and four-year institutions need to start thinking about lifetime learning and, and where are the bridges and the pathways between, between those silos. So I'll stop there to get comments back. No, nicely said, nicely said, Giselle. Uh, let, let me, while people are, are, are ruminating, let me bring up a few of the chat comments about this, uh, which are kind of all over the place. Um, yeah. uh, Charles Finley, uh, who I think is in Boston, said that the Boston new mayor, Mayor Wu, has a free tuition plan for community colleges. Uh, Sarah San Gregorio mentions that going to a community college helped her husband when he flamed out of his four-year institution as a sophomore. I credit the community college with getting him back on track yep. to graduate with his BA. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, as Shelby uh, Rosengarten, who represents CCs, um, said, uh, I know a lot of DE students choose it over AP because they will get the credit rather than gamble on an exam with a passing score. That's fascinating. I haven't heard that. That's really interesting. Uh, and then Mark Wilson gives a, a, a more critical view, saying the educators use community colleges as resume builders, administrators hire adjuncts as a downward spiral. Uh, so that's a, a kind of mixed view from the audience right now uh, of, of where this could be going. Uh, Tom, you've got a question from Shelby, uh, who wants to know, uh, when you when you mentioned um, liberal arts and and uh, connections between HCC and UT, uh, was that a direct admin bridge program or will this be- uh, I answered it in the chat, but um, no, I mean, it's all one program. So they actually, I was part of the team that helped put that together about a decade ago, but they actually, we actually mapped out the curriculum so that uh, it's not a two plus two, it's a four year degree essentially where mm. uh, you're knocking out, um, you take, you take, it's not like you take all the HCC classes at the beginning and then all the UT Tyler classes at the end, you, you're taking some of the uh, UT Tyler classes a little earlier and also because there's a progression to get through an engineering degree at a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and so then you're still taking and you leave some of the HCC classes behind you, but you take them still as a junior and senior because they're all here. I mean, the whole program is housed here. You know, right. it's it's a UT Tyler program, but the classes are 100 percent in Houston. So thank you. Thank yeah. you. Well, and I'm wondering if that is a, a growth area, because I, I mean, I know Emerson at one point tried. Um, I don't know sort of how well we we held it up, but we were trying to convert, you know, community college and to, to folks who would come here, although we have a pretty specific focus, which is not for mm. everyone. So we have different models that uh, that are not quite as integrated as the UT Tyler program, but we also have the same kind of partnerships with A&M and um, uh, Texas A&M and the University of Houston, okay. uh, which are uh, articulated models more where it's more of a two plus two. But um, the uh, um, uh, and then you do have to, I think you do still have to get admitted to the U of H or A&M program at, at that point midway through. So it, yeah. yeah, you can come up with a different agreement with different partners and you know mix and match. But I think we need to start thinking about how we blend all this stuff. Yeah, because um, I, I mean, I am seeing it as a growth pattern, right? So a high school student gets out of high school with a community college degree. Right. And then as you said, cost mm -hmm. is a huge issue, tuition. Like, well, you can get a four year degree, you know, two more years, half the price, um, right. but building that more formally. Yeah, we've had some great uh, experiences as well with early college, which is a fully blended where you mm. where you graduate as a senior in high school with an associate's degree as well. Wow. And actually, I think that's the absolute best model because those students are 100 percent built into the program and they're working through high school at that level. The problem with dual credit is that um, you're blending two different cultures, especially when you're teaching at the high school level. And that creates friction because yeah. high school has a certain pace to it. College has a certain pace to it. And uh, that's the number one complaint I hear from my, my fellow faculty who teach in, 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 uh, in the actual institution 
all right, in the actual high school. You know, you got the bell, you got announcements and bells and pep rallies and all this other stuff, and and that really gets in the way of of focusing on the learning. Whereas a, an early college scenario, those students go to a different campus that's nothing but dual credit. And, well, and I'm um, wondering about the ties with the homeschool market because uh, you know the, oh. the the teenager I know going to community college is homeschooling and doing that, so it was completely left behind the the high school environment altogether. Um, you know, it's homeschooling and and finds community college much better for that kind of pacing. Um, I will admit my older siblings ditched high school altogether to go to community college. So to me, this is like uh -huh. a really obvious thing that, that you know, it, it obviously doesn't work for everybody, but there there is a population mm -hmm. that it absolutely makes sense for. My daughter did the same thing, actually. Yeah. Um, she hated high school and she wanted to save money on the first few years of college. Um, and, uh, and as is her want, she did what she wanted. Um, <laughs> but, but definitely community colleges do have to adapt significantly right when you do have 60 year olds in your classroom and 14 year olds right that that creates a very different environment to work with and you know that the faculty really have to sort of think through what they're doing and how they how they approach things but mark made a mark in the mark wilson in the chat made a very important point there and he said that um the seniors need resources not programs and i think the problem there is that no we don't want to think about this as uh, pop, plopping them into a seat and getting a two-year degree Correct. at 60 or whatever. The, this yeah. is, again, we, we've we got the, the the degrees, credit hours, all of this grades and everything else that goes with that. Those are all part of the industrialization of education. And um, if they become meaningless, which frankly, they're well on the way to doing that in some areas, uh, then that's where we're getting this pushback. You know, uh, is that's that's different from learning stuff, mm. right? We need a structure to learn stuff, but that's a different kind of structure necessarily than plopping everybody into a 16 week class or a five week class or a whatever. You know, all of the different little boxes that we've built for people to, to fall into when they learn. The, the reality is that learning doesn't work that way, period. Uh, you don't learn on a schedule. You don't learn English at nine o'clock and history at 10 o'clock. Your brain isn't oh. built to do that. I don't have a history time and an English time uh, or a math time or whatever, although mornings are generally better for me. Um, but everybody works a little differently as far as that's concerned. Right. Uh, but the, I mean, the biggest problem I run into with community college students is that the 16 week semester doesn't work for them. It's either too long or too short. Uh -huh. It's too uh -huh. long because things happen um i'm uh D dean dad had the some really great comments on this on the show he did well god it's a couple of years back now where he was talking about these you know five week programs where you take a lot fewer classes but you they're much more intensive over a short period of time well, like and a block program yeah the success rates on those are much higher because there's less less that can go wrong in five weeks than in 16 and and you're only risking one or maybe two classes in that scenario if something does go wrong as opposed to a 16 week semester you may be risking five classes and having to flush all that down the toilet and start over so that's one but the other thing is there's students who just need more time to process the stuff that i'd like to work for long like to work with for longer than 16 weeks because to get their brains wrapped around the college level stuff because of the deficiencies that they come into class with um just takes that much longer not everybody moves at the same speed here so how you know we don't have there's a certain amount of flex you can build within the box that is the 16 week semester but once you get outside that box i gotta turn my grades in i'm sorry you're out of luck yeah right in in, in, the, in the chat she'll be uh adds when she's had senior auditors so i, I presume this means senior citizens not academic mm -hmm. seniors they're there for the content that they've always wanted the time to learn they really enjoy the time to learn about literature, culture, history, interacting with other students. Um, but just just listening to where where you're all going, uh, there's this is I think that moment in the forum when we get very radical. Uh, we had uh, uh, this happened. That moment us. occurred when you put me on stage. Well, no, no, there's a different word for that. But uh, there, uh, uh, but but we had uh, uh, we had comments from uh, two people in the chat who uh, John Hollenbeck says that a degree granting institution cannot provide lifelong learning. 
Yeah, I was going to jump on that one. <laughs> go, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to be good. Go ahead, Giselle. You know, sometimes I wonder whether or not we get caught up in linguistics. You know, life, this article, I would love, Brian, if you would redo this uh, after everyone's read Burning Glasses article, right? Mm, mm, mm. Because the context is subtle. It, it's not your seniors coming in for enrichment. That's actually not what the article refers to. It refers to all the trends show that most adults, you know, starting at age 25 in their lifetime could have as many as 12 jobs. When I graduated from college, it was a no-no to switch jobs. Okay. That's not the case today. There isn't loyalty in employment. There is a career ladder. Right. And so what what is based the message, you know, for those of you in a in a four year university environment is, you know, how can you prepare? Because uh, the point I think Tom made a little earlier as well is that even businesses don't know what they need. So they're hiring people and finding out, well, that's not really the skills I need. So they have to, the two groups have to come together to say, oh, okay. So what I used to think was public relations is now content marketing, hmm. Hmm. you know, and those terms are changing faster than we can possibly imagine. Tom, you're shaking your head. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> please every, build on it. Tech technology morphs. I mean, it's it's it's, it's morphed it's the, everything. It's, it's the great melting pot, right? I mean, the modern melting pot, maybe. Uh, and that uh, uh, it's it, everything. No one works in a specific job anymore. No one. I mean, there there are some people who still work on an assembly line. They're part of that machine that is the factory, you know. But uh, there are less and less of those because because those are the kind of jobs that are easily automated. Uh, and so as a result, we all have to riff around the edges of our jobs, you know, pretty much no matter what we're doing. Um, yeah. uh, you know, as, even as, let's say you're a pure researcher, you're still having to practice communication skills to get funding for your Correct. pure research, right? So you're having to, and you're having to interact with, you know, networks of people and use technologies that uh, enable you to do this sort of stuff. Um, teachers, oh God, you know, you're doing everything. You have to play, you know, you have to be a one man band or one woman band if you're a teacher, uh, uh, you know, and so, I mean, it's, 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 uh, and especially now if I teach like this all the time. I mean, I teach in zoom. I haven't, I haven't been in a real classroom since 2020, since the pandemic hit. And, um, mainly cause you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty right. good at riffing the technology. And so my chair says, oh, yeah, well, we need these. And that's what the students are demanding, too, by the way. You know? So, I mean, all of these things lead to a much more fluid environment. And that's both wonderful because it gives us the ability to explore. In, you know, you're not going to be a window installer on the Ford assembly plant for the rest of your life. Yeah. You have the opportunity to be whatever you grow into, because I can bet you a lot of those window installers would have loved to have been a lion tamer. Um, sorry, Monty Python reference. <laughs> but that's exactly that's the joke, right? I mean, he's an accountant who wants to be a lion tamer. And so now we have the ability to all be lion tamers. We can tame virtual lions and not get ripped from arm to arm and so on and so forth. But I mean, but I, what do the I, lion I tamers want to do? Uh, <laughs> they want to be accountants because no, they want to be actors. Right. Christopher Walken was a lion tamer. No I way. That's, that's what they want to do. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not gonna be able to unsee that image. <laughs> lion, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I'm really an actor. But, but Brian, one, one real drop of spice to add to this conversation. I'm going to ask maybe even John to take my place on the stage. John, uh, the, the question I would beg is then degree institutions need to start examining what are the changes that are, uh, you know, in front of us and are they prepared? 
And that's where my first point was how many of your continuing education departments or at least building micro credentials and boot camps, et cetera, so that they can really do test the waters because until you know what your community educational needs are, you know, you build it and they will come. If you build, you know, a new program in cybersecurity and all of a sudden you don't, you can't even fit everyone, you can't take all the candidates, that tells you something. Whereas if you build a program in, you know, uh, arts and literature, and you only get three people, that mm. tells you something. It does. Can it I does. Ask, throw in Please. maybe on the other end, because, okay, so we talk a lot about what do employers want and how higher ed needs to pay attention to that. But one of the things employers need to pay attention to is some shifts in thinking of their future employees. Of My course. sister has what she calls, this is the generation of, that's a you problem. Um, yes. because, you know, th there's a lot of things where some of the younger folks, not to generalize, but to say there's some trends in, they're saying, oh, you want us to have this skills? Fine, pay us, train us. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We're, we're not going to put in the investment and then maybe you'll give us a reward for it. You train us, you pay for us to go to school and then we'll give you what you need. Interesting, that's a you problem. <laughs> she she has some teenage sons. <laughs> I, I, I like the sound of this. Um, and, and thank you, thank you, Elena. And by the way, Elena, thank you for being on stage okay. uh, today. Uh, I really appreciate this. Um, Giselle, you summoned the spirit of John Hollenbeck and lo, <laughs> lo, he appears. Uh, so like right all. You, you can't say Hollenbeck, Hollenbeck, Hollenbeck. You know That's right. I mean? You gotta say it in front of a mirror. I mean, this is this is the this is the uh, here. Let me uh, let me arrange things a bit. Um, you can take me off if you want, Brian. I'm glad to have you here, Giselle. Uh, <laughs> Stay here and take it. John, welcome and uh, congratulations on the North Country summer. I appreciate. I'm really glad to see that. Oh yeah, but it's only until this weekend, and then we were actually forecast to have snow until last night when they changed it to cold rain. That sounds that sounds right. So enjoy it. So, Joe, what do you, what do you think? Um, I mean, you 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 you're you're talking about abolishing the institutions because they can't function for lifelong learning. Um, what tell tell us more? I'm a I'm a I'm a bitter retired academic now, so I can say what I, I feel like. I actually have a, a blog called the Edge of Curmudgeon. That's great, <laughs> but. No, I, I think that, I mean, first of all, on the subject that we're talking about, my answer to what's what's going to change in academia in six months or a year is nothing. Nothing will change. Mm. And what's going on with these technologies like chat, GBT, and everything else are peripheral. The real things that are going wrong in education and always going wrong are things like external assessment, teachers being in the dual role of being the provider of knowledge and the judge of whether you acquired the knowledge, um, which is a point Eric Mazur makes in the, the link I made. So I mean, mm -hmm. I mean the problems mm -hmm. are huge and completely uh, on a different scale than what we're comfortable talking about. So I think that what's happening is that companies and this i can see that when i was teaching in san francisco in the late 90s cisco was offering a, a network administration degree and the graduates would would make like three times what i was making as a professor and they're offering those to high school kids it was training and it, you know the only thing that keeps us as an institution viable and the higher education viable is the mythology surrounding the college degree we say you'll make a million dollars more. Right. I was a dean of education in New Mexico, and we you try to give that to a poor person sitting on land that's been in his family for 400 years. No, it just doesn't fly. A million, nobody's going to make a million dollars out there, let alone a million dollars more. So I think, you know, we're, we're just in so many, we're so balled up in a lot of, practices and everything else is that I just, I, it, it won't change. It can't change. And I really do think we need a new way, a new kind of institution. John, I can give you a statistic 
that you could chew on and move in a different direction is some are not going to change. Mm -hmm. Some are going to change and some are going to disappear. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not going to all of a sudden be, you know, a completely new restructured entity. But here's a statistic I want to leave with the audience. Uh, if you haven't looked at the work that Credential Engine is doing, it's okay. worth your while. Okay. They, they have compiled over 1 million credentials in the skills-based economy. And they have also identified that those credentials are being offered by 59,000 educational providers. Wow. Think about that number. Mm -hmm. Brian, give me, because wow. it's a moving number. I think we only have 6,000 institutions of higher education in this country, including graduate schools, community colleges, and four-year, correct? Yeah, closer to four. So that's a very small percentage of 59,000 providers. Wow. So, so it means adults are getting trained outside of the walls of a university. And that's mm -hmm. alarming. 59,000. That's a, that's a huge, huge difference. Um, uh, wow. Wow. Um, in, uh, uh, in, in, in the chat, uh, uh, Kiel says that we need a new set of institutions. Um, high school has turned into a scattered and aimless warm up act for college. Um, I mean, it, it sounds like on the one hand, we're describing some kind of sclerosis where uh, yeah. higher education cannot change. And John, if I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing you or reacting back to you, I mean, that we're, we're locked in place by all kinds of forces. And I think Giselle, your question before, how many, uh, how many campuses represented here in this conversation are actually expanding their uh, adult learning? And the answer was none. In fact, we had one which canceled it. Um, and that's an interesting example of this. On the other hand, we seem to be in a consensus here that, uh, that we think that the current ecosystem of education from K through 12 through higher ed and grad school is not really fit for the purpose of lifelong learning or a 60 year curriculum. That kind of make, leaves us an interesting endpoint where we have to think on the one hand, what happens to this ecosystem, but then how do we design something new? How do we get uh, Kiel his new set of institutions? Um, so that we can actually support people in lifelong learning. I would start with making performance the judge, not credential, not a third party person, but mm -hmm. what can you do? I was a professional trombone player in my first life. It's what came out of the end of the horn. It's mm -hmm. what it sounded like. Nobody cared about your education. Mm -hmm. and I've seen that in so many technology jobs now. They don't care who you are. They care what you can do. That's right. And that's an instructional design thing. What are people able to do at the end of this learning experience? Right. Right. And and that's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very much a big fan of tangible work product. My, my students create a public website as, as a tangible evidence of what they, how, they, how, they, how effectively they can communicate, use visual information. Uh, put all that stuff together and everything in the course is oriented toward building that website. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I teach government. Okay. So it's all the course. I mean, the, the students identify a challenge, a problem in society that they want to see fixed. Uh, they then uh, look for solutions that have been tried out and do they work? And then they look and ask the answer to the question. The final part of it is how do I tell someone how to navigate through either the American or the Texas political system, depending on which course it is. And that's how they actually use the knowledge. And this shows a bunch of different levels. One, I teach a basic government class. I'm not expecting to teach politicians here. I'm trying to teach citizens. And that's my number one priority. And understanding how you fit into this system and how you can affect change in this system is essential to a, a, a good democratic citizen, a little d democratic citizen. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I want to be careful about that. Um, but uh, but the thing is, this this website is theirs. And I tell them, at the end of the day, if you do this right, this website's going to matter so much more to you than the fact that you got to be in a government class. Because you can show this to an employer and say, I know how to communicate complex information to people who don't necessarily understand it. I can put together, I have the technical skills, but more importantly, have the narrative skills. 
in order to make myself understood to my cust your customers, to my fellow employees, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's only one piece of the puzzle, but that's the best I can do given a 16-week semester in teaching government. But it's something that goes well beyond the realities of the class. I can't expect them to play trombone. I'm a yeah, trumpet they, player, John, by the way. They, but, oh, no. But do you give them an A <laughs> if they manage to get a constitutional amendment passed? <laughs> See, but you know, Tom, this is Texas. We don't have popular. Yeah, they don't have, they don't have A's either. But I mean, just real briefly, you you went to the exact point though. Yeah. What they can get done in the limits of sixteen weeks in the context of the subject you're supposed to teach. Life is not that way. That's right. Life, right. Life is not a set of semesters. Right. But and you, I get frustrated. That's where I get to this whole thing of the semesters either too long or too short. Some people can do it quicker. Some people really need more time. So I, 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 I have to just kind of gesture in this direction. Uh, first of all, I, I hate to pause this conversation because this has been delightful. Um, I, I just love seeing you all here um, and, and, and having you all and watching this conversation just continue. Let me pull out a couple of points from the chat which seem to line up with this. Uh, our Sarah St. Gregorio says she was an actor who fell into instructional design training she got an MS so she could get past the AI resume checkers, but she had those tech and design skills already. So then we've got the combination of actually being able to do stuff and the credentialing it, right? Um, Mark Wilson gives us a fantastic phrase, non-disposable products of learning. <laughs> That's really, really good. And then Brian Mulligan, who has a great name, although there's a typo in it, um, uh, says, Perhaps we need an institution that only measures competence, that might free up other organizations to innovate in many other ways to develop those competencies. Competition generates innovation better than central planning. Uh, what a what a great cusp of a design moment to to end on. Um, thank thank you all uh, for for coming in. Um, and uh, Elena, thank you for being on stage uh, and with all these uh, wild people. Um, uh, John, thank you for coming here and, and, and taking time out of your glorious day. Uh, Tom, thank you for taking a break um, and joining us in your blue room. Uh, and, and Giselle, not only thank you for presenting New Orleans, but thank you for your very, very powerful facilitation and conversational skills. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap things up here. Let me kick people off the stage so that they can relax. And uh, let me then just bring up the last slide, which tells you where things are headed next. Um, I, I really, I really enjoyed that. I, I think that was just great in terms of a kind of free-flowing, organic conversation, which ended up in a really, really great place. Thank you to everybody for for making that happen. Um, looking ahead on the forum, we have a session coming up in ed tech and labor and a whole bunch more. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us and you can and see more there. Uh, if you want to keep talking about this, how are we going to redesign the entire education system for actual purpose for lifelong learning? Just use the hashtag FTTE wherever you are or at me on uh, Twitter or at Mastodon. Be glad to keep talking. If you want to go back into our past, including our sessions on micro-credentials, our sessions on lifelong learning, on design thinking, and so on, just go to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive. Uh, and above all, thanks all for thinking together. This has been a real treat. Um, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, spring up here in the Northern Hemisphere. I hope this has given you some food for thought as you look ahead to the rest of 2023. And above all, I hope all of you stay well. Take care, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>